the art community is freaking out over artificial intelligence right now. And honestly, yeah, rightfully so. But this isn't the first time the art industry has undergone a major shift and it won't be the last. In the mid to late 90s, 2D animation was being really quickly replaced by 3D animation. And artists like Adam Duff, who had spent their entire college careers mastering that craft, quickly found themselves out of a job. Adam Duff spent months unemployed and eventually had to give in and learn 3D animation from the ground up. And that kicked off what would eventually become an illustrious career in the video game industry. Adam for 15 years worked for companies like Nintendo and PlayStation and now is celebrating his 10 year anniversary on YouTube. I think Adam is probably the best person to talk to about this major shift and more broadly like how to pivot and how to navigate the ever-changing art market. And I recently had the chance to sit down with Adam and talk about the 20 plus year career he's led so far and the advice he would give to aspiring artists. So I started in video games. I worked on PlayStation games, Nintendo, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of people, I mentioned in my last video that I've worked on the game Scaler, and everybody was like, oh, you worked on Scaler? I was like, I didn't know anybody liked that game, but cool, you know? Um, so yeah, I did that. And then from there, I went from video game to video game to video game. I kept working on different studios and stuff like that. Eventually, I ended up uh, directing. I got into art directing, and then I started directing at EA for a little while. And... Uh, um, I bet I missed art. I missed drawing because when you're a director, you don't get to draw. Although I, I like directing. I like teaching more than directing. It's kind of a different dynamic as far as that goes. Teaching is more of a we're learning together. Directing is more of a you're expected to know what you're doing. And that's not my style so much. I like to teach more. And uh, so, yeah, I was doing that. And then I supervised on a Disney show for a little while. And after that, I decided I want to teach. I really want to do my own thing and I want to teach. So back in uh, 2015, I found I started Lucid Pixel, the online mentorship, and it immediately just took off. It was just it just blew up right away, and I've been doing that ever since. It's been my full time job, best job I've ever had. Yeah. Wow. So when you were at that point of like, do I stay in industry or do I really like kind of go freelance? Like, what were you thinking, and what really kind of like pushed you? to make that choice. It must've been like kind of scary at the time. And like, you're at this crossroads, you have no idea what to do. What kind of led mm -hmm. you to make that decision? It's a good question. It's a really good question. And it was one that took a lot of courage on my part to be able to make, um, albeit one of the things that really, really surprised me. And it had happened actually twice. There was a period in my career where my art career was kind of crappy. I was kind of an animator and nobody wanted me. And I was kind of in this transitional period. So I started this, uh, I started a, a swing and jive dance venue and I just did it off the fly. I had zero money in my pocket because I was a broke, you know, loveless artist. And I decided, screw it, I'm going to start a, a thing. And it was really easy, just getting the people together and DJs and everything. And I went, oh my God, like, this is the first time I actually just created my own employment. And I had no idea what to think about it, but I realized I really like this. I like, I like being in touch with the whole process of building something and but i took it for granted because i'm an artist so i decided no i'm an artist this is who i am and i let that go after a couple of years and then i got back into art did the studio thing for a while and then i when i it was link sweetie stop he's trying to take something off my shelf no dude, you're gonna break that pumpkin so um uh this as much as you know working in studios was fun and people go "Ooh, you worked at disney how cool I, I never i didn't think in the long run that i was much of the studio type i felt i was the politics and the the you know people always trying to fight to, everybody's always afraid of their jobs and the backstabbing and all that kind of crap it's just not my thing you know i'm more of a community oriented type of person so after that whole thing i started teaching for a little while i taught at a at a, at a, co a college in montreal i call them cjeps I, st I taught at a CJEP uh, for several years. And when I started teaching, it was, I, I had found my calling. And it was at that point that I realized my whole, I came from a whole family of teachers. It was something I totally took for granted. I was kind of yeah. raised by, I was raised by parents and grandparents that all had that teacher vibe and that teacher style of communication. And when I walked into that, when I walked into that school and I started teaching, I literally found all my kindred spirits. I walked into a, a family and I loved it. 
But at the same time, just again, politically speaking, you know, as far as the school system and as far as the fact that I was teaching 40, 50 students at the same time, I recognized artists as being individuals. I recognized students as being individuals that all have their own thing. You have to, you have to really be able to identify what a person's unique strengths are. Yeah. And uh, what really makes them them, because one of the big frustrations was I loved every one of my students and I really wanted the best for all of my students. But I could see some need, like had a specific type of skill that needed to be pulled out individually. But I have 15 minutes. How are you going to do that in 15 minutes? So I decided, I remember kind of reading up on like the old masters and how, you know, there was usually a tutelage and there was like there were mentors and it was private, like Da Vinci and all these different artists and stuff like that. And uh, uh, I, th I thought to myself, that's how I want to do it. I want to keep it private. I want my teaching to be one on one. And I've had the opportunity to do classes. I've refused that. I've decided to keep it one on one. And at that point, I thought to myself, I'm in the perfect place to start this new thing because I knew that I had a frustration and I realized one of the things that I'd learned in the past was one of the best reasons to start a new business is when you can see there's a hole when you can see there's a gap when you can see there's something that doesn't work and yeah, it's that's called a market gap or at least that's how I think about it okay I, I don't I don't know anything yeah. about business so so I kind of just I do it as more from a human's perspective right yeah yeah no thought, that, that's great yeah that's a great process yeah and I thought, I thought, I love to teach. I want to bring back the old, the old way. I want to be able to, to really get to know and to befriend and really have a real relationship with any, every one of my students. Uh, so I, I launched Lucid Pixel and it kind of solved everything at once because it pulled me out of the politics of studios, which I suck at. Do you think that like art, four year traditional kind of art education universities are preparing artists for like the modern world and like you know we see like mid journey and all of that stuff like revolutionizing the art industry in real time in ways that we haven't even fully realized yet do you think that the art education industry as it stands right now is really prepared to catch up to and evolve and like shift gears to respond to those changes um i think it depends on where you are i think that nationality plays a very big role in that if you look at a lot of like in north america unless you're in like one of the top schools you know like the cal arts types of places um then i find that very often school systems tend to be a little bit archaic you know like kind of teaching old school illustration styles that really don't apply to anything that we do today i do see that um, but if you're in the good school where you're making good connections and you've got that beeline to disney type of thing or beeline to blizzard um, yeah, but if you're in the States, you're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to get that kind of access. Um, right. Oh, no, no. It's, it's to me, that's one of the number one reasons why I started my mentorship. So I graduated college, um, a little over a year ago and I had like a, I majored in political science and then minored mm. in philosophy and studio art and the studio art classes that I took at like my small liberal arts school, which is very prestigious. Like. I picked it because they funded my entire education. I otherwise wow. would not have been able to go yeah. um, because like, like you, you know, I don't have a rich mommy and daddy um, that came from the ground up, you know, and that's a lot of people's situation. But yeah. I left those art classes not really having like the foundational knowledge or the toolkit that I really need to solve creative problems that I'm facing in my creative practice all the time. So for someone who might be like me or maybe is completely self-taught and on their journey start, sort of starting out what are some resources that you would recommend or like a like a workflow to really catching up to a comparable art education elsewhere i think anywhere you go um you're going to hear this from any professional art teacher in any in any art field be it dance be it cooking be it you know uh, be it singing be it music be it art fundamentals Fundamentals is the toolkit. This is somebody saying, these are the tools you need to do the job, period. And uh, that's, that's the foundation. And usually when it comes to different types of artists, if there's any weakness professionally, it's usually one of these checklist fundamentals, perspective, anatomy, uh, value, color, composition, visual storytelling. Those are the, the kind of like the, the core. From there, that's what the cool things about online is that all these different artists have different styles, right? If I'm looking for something very design focused, something very creature design, something very character focused, Anthony Jones, right away. I don't even have to think about it because I, I can see what he does. 
right? Or Ahmed, who's got a very classical background, but very fantasy art, very video gamey type of thing. Or, you know, or for Clint, who's got uh, that Magic the Gathering vibe. Darken, same thing. He's got that Magic the, the Gathering vibe. Or Online Art Academy. He's that classic illustrator with that, you know, that, that he's got that Norman Rockwell Frazetta background to him, right? So once you've got those fundamentals down and you're comfortable with that, that's when you start to specialize and find your niche. And the niche is usually where you find the most employability. At the beginning, when you've got your, when you've got your fundamentals, that'll get you into the door to try out different things. But once you start to find your niche, you start to, like you, your art starts to become a brand that people can go, oh, I want that for my project. And people actually start seeking you out. But that's usually when you really find your career really starts to kick off quite a bit. Yeah. The short answer is you're going to be learning fundamentals every day for the rest of your life. I'm still, I still go over my fundamentals every single day. Every single time I draw, I'm practicing my fundamentals. I'm just, I'm just focusing on them in the context of a project that I'm working on at that particular point in time. Um, how much time you dedicate, I think is a balance. If I was to kind of instruct you, I wouldn't say this many hours. No, because some people can make great progress in 30 minutes. Some people need six hours. It depends on your tempo, right? But I would say that um, um, consistency. So try to do it at least at least three times a week if you can. If you can get some time. If you're a parent and you've, you're working full time, you might not have as much time. Consistency and within healthy, within a healthy uh, uh, boundary. Because... A lot of people teach and a lot of people study by sitting down for 12 hours straight and just draw, draw, draw. I right? did, yeah. I didn't learn a thing about how heads were structured. It was totally useless. <laughs> and how did you feel after that much work? I felt exhausted, frankly. Like I had to take three weeks to do it because right. I had to draw like 10 heads every single day when I'd like never really been very talented at heads in the first place. Like I'm a landscape oil painter. Um, like the facial structure is not really like in my forte, you know, like yeah. it's not part of my toolkit. It was something totally alien to me. Yeah. And so having to do that was just, it was exhausting and I had to take way more time to it than I expected to because I just had to pace myself in ways that I wasn't expecting. Okay. Okay. Now take what you just said and multiply that by 15 years. How would you feel then? Yeah. Right? Totally burnt out. I probably quit before I even really reached where I wanted to be. Yeah. Hey, listen, I was never the best artist. I was never the star artist, but I was the one who always paid attention to my health. <laughs> well, that's not entirely true. I didn't for a certain period of time in it, and I did, I did very, come very close to burning out. Um, but it's, 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 it's best summarized in a quote from, from Jeff Cavalier from Athlean X, and I've quoted him before. Are you doing what you can, or are you doing what you should? Right. Mm -hmm. And to me, growth is about maintaining a healthy balance, something that you can do consistently every day. That's how you get in shape. You don't get in shape by like working out for 16 hours, seven days a week for a year. No, yeah. that's how you destroy yourself. And the same thing applies to art. Your body and your mind cannot sustain that in a healthy way. So three times a week, if you can do a couple of hours, three, four hours, remember to take breaks regularly, you'll find very healthy, steady growth. And because you're keeping yourself in this learning loop all the time, you're always keeping that, sorry, sweetie, he's, I'm hitting his leg, it keeps twitching. Uh, you keep yourself in this artistic stimulated state. You're not allowing yourself to detach from it too much. So for me, when I'm not actually physically drawing, I'm thinking about it. I'm planning what I'm going to do next with a painting. I'm thinking about what I'm going to do after I'm finished with painting. I'm keeping myself in this mental loop of creativity. And I don't let myself go for three months because I have more than once. And when you do, it's hard to get yourself back into it. You kind of, you have to re spark. Oh, yeah. It's like a relationship. If you're not, if you're in a relationship and you don't, if you don't show each other affection, you lose sight of affection and you kind of get used to the being in a non affection type of place. You have to physically actively go out of your way to keep that flame alive. Same thing applies to art, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and as long as you can do it consistently, and as long as you're not, as long as you're not getting back problems and sciatic problems from from you know from sitting too long, and you're not getting stressed or anxiety or depression if you're eating properly and sleeping properly, and you're still working regularly, that's that's as far as I take it. If you have more energy and you're obsessed over this project and you're just having a load of fun, go and spend as much time as you want. Just remember not to destroy your body in the process, right? Doing this 
for 12 hours adds up, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, all right, switching gears a little yeah. bit. You do a lot as um, a teacher, a freelancer, a YouTuber. That's an enormous amount of responsibilities. How do you, like, structure your work schedule to really make time for everything and still have that balance in your life so you don't get burned out? Good, good question. I, I I don't do too much. I always do, like I said before, what is sustainable, right? So when it came to being a YouTuber, just for example, when it comes to being a YouTuber, I commit myself as best as I can to one video a week. I try to, at a certain point, do two videos a week. And I found myself in a constant state of worrying about the next video. Constantly, wor I, I'm starting to, I was starting to get, you know, annoyed because like, I'm tr Daddy's trying to work. Yeah, but Dad, it's nine o'clock at night. Yeah, no, I know, but I have a video. It was becoming an obsessive lifestyle. And I thought after doing that for a couple of months, I said, no, stop. Once a week was sustainable. I can do that and teach twice a day, five days a week. No problem. And at, at, at 5 p.m., once my kids are home, it's... If they're not home and if they're doing other things, maybe I'll put a couple of hour, extra hours in. Otherwise, no. I turn my computer off. Maybe I'll answer a couple of emails, but otherwise I'm spending the time with my family. I, dis I make an active point of disconnecting from my work, right? Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, and I, I wasn't like this back when I was a student. <laughs> I used to be kind of all over the place with my structure, but now I'm, I'm almost obsessively organized. So my calendar entries, being very meticulous to make sure everything's in place. My studio, how do I set it up? How everything is connected is for very be able to get myself up and running very quickly. Um, uh, being very, very meticulous with how I schedule, who I schedule with, how I, uh, how I organize my time um, so that I'm not wasting time um, looking for things trying to get myself set up. I want everything ready when, when it's set. And like my studio space is, is like my sanctuary. I make sure everything is very carefully set up because if I don't, my work immediately suffers for that. You know, I'm, I find myself in maintenance mode rather than productivity mode. So I think organization is huge and managing your time and setting boundaries. So when it comes to like how I communicate with people, um, I have to set boundaries on how much I can communicate, how often I can communicate with other people. I set a time for that because when you get tons of emails from people who are commenting on your videos or they want to reach out for, for advice on stuff, I have to be able to at a certain point say, okay, I have to stop there because now I'm running a full-time counseling <laughs> business up until midnight. And at a certain point, it just becomes unmanageable. So you kind of, you have to learn to set your boundaries and focus on your main priorities. Yeah. What were some really hard lessons that inspired that structure? Like, was there a certain point of like a big mistake that you made or a regret that you had that really forced you to place that structure in place? Um, yeah, I think it, you know, a lot of these behaviors come from childhood experiences or growing up. My experience in school, for instance, when I was young, I was always, Adam was always the guy who had so much potential. If only he applied himself, you know, and a lot of it was um, a lot of it was leaving things till the last second, not like uh, kind of trusting my memory too much, like saying, I'll, I'll remember to do that and then not remembering to do that. Um, uh, I think those were when I was younger, I could get away with doing stuff like that. But once it came time, once I started to become a professional, that lack of structure kind of kicked me in the ass. And I learned quickly to keep myself organized and to manage myself properly. And I think to me, the thing that really, really made me as, as meticulous as I am today, particularly now, was all about my business. It was all about the school because my performance affects people directly. And, and I, yeah. I found for me, I think the thing that really made me take better care of myself and my structure and my, my decisions and my behavior. Not that I was ever terrible, but I was bad enough was being a father, being a teacher. And I realized I, the best comes out of me when I'm responsible for other people. I, I'll let myself down. I don't care, whatever, you know, 
but I will, never let, yeah. I will never let anybody else down, right? And if somebody's depending on me, I will, I, I will, I will kill myself before I disappoint somebody else. So when my students are there, I'm there on time, always on time, always ready, always ready to answer a question, always, and, and that keeps me structured. Because if I don't maintain myself properly, I'm going to start to fail a bunch of people. And I, I, I won't accept that. But if it was just me doing my own thing, you know what I mean? Whatever. I'll let myself slip. No problem. Yeah. So I think it's accountability, I think, keeps me really in shape. For sure. Yeah. Do you still find time for, like, personal artwork um, amidst, like, this busy schedule? And kind of how do you balance your business kind of responsibilities with, like, your school and the art that you have to make for YouTube videos with, like, maybe personal work that you might not want to share on other platforms? Uh, well, I kill two birds with one stone, right? So my YouTube art is my personal stuff. Basically, my portfolio is public. Look at it that way, right? So when I'm producing, yeah. when I'm producing YouTube videos, it's purely personal work, purely personal. I'm, I'm doing my thing my way, period. Um, since, and since I'm not, this isn't something I'm giving to a studio. I'm not actually providing a service to a studio. I can do whatever I want in that regard. I can really indulge. And I think it was that in, in that indulging that I really discovered myself the most artistically. Because I wasn't just always trying to cater to the, to the demands of a client. I was really learning my own taste. So yeah, I, I basically do that by, by multitasking. My personal work is my YouTube video, basically. Yeah. That's smart. I love doing that too, yeah. like setting like my goals as an artist and like making a video about yeah. that, trying to like link them all together so that I, I don't disappoint myself and don't let myself yeah. down because merging those two systems together is the best, the best way yeah. to go. So you've been a YouTuber for 10 years, you said earlier. Yeah. That's insane. Like that, that's insane. Yeah, it feels, um, that, it feels like YouTube that analytics. Yeah. yeah. Like YouTube's coming on its 20 year anniversary in a couple of years now. It's the fact that you've been on the platform for like almost half of I its didn't entire even life. That. Is... No kidding. Yeah. 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 It's insane. Yeah. So YouTube analytics can be like a, an incredibly addicting roller coaster yeah. when a video does poorly that like you were really invested in, it can feel terrible. But when you do experience a video not doing as well, how do you respond to that? Does that affect your decision making for the next videos? Does it like, put you in a bad mood for the rest of the day or how much stock do you put into the analytics in the moment? None. Zero. Uh, I never, I, I cared a little bit for a little while to me. Um, uh, well, I, if you go back, well, here's a, here's a, here's a good lesson for a YouTuber. Um, you go back maybe five, six years ago or not even that much, maybe geez, three years ago, maybe. Um, up until that point, I was, a lot of people don't know this, but maybe three years ago, I was at, I, I was trickling in maybe one or two subs a day. And I think I was at around, somewhere around like maybe 18, 20,000 sub, subscribers or something like that. Some of my videos did well, some of them didn't. And I kept trying to, at the time, I was trying to be a YouTuber. Make sure your videos are less than 12 minutes long. Make sure that they're advertiser friendly. Make sure that you're using a lot of edits to keep people's energy going. And, you know, start with start with something interesting. And, and I, I did that for years and it was never authentic. It never felt my, my art talks were authentic, but the structure and the way I was talking and the music was so it was it was designed to entertain. Right. And the same lesson I learned in my career was the same lesson I learned as an artist, was the same lesson I learned as a teacher. And that is, screw what people want, be authentic, be yourself. And at that point, I stopped and I thought to myself, well, what do I listen to when I paint? My audience are artists. My audience are, are sitting there listening to me painting. They're sitting there listening to me creating art, most likely. Or they're sitting there listening to me feeling like shit about their art, <laughs> right? And um, I thought about some of the YouTubers that I would listen to, like like Vati Vidya and Let Me Know, and I'd listen to David Attenborough documentaries, or I'd listen to, you know, painting videos of uh, of Jisweb Bekshinsky in his studio, his diary, his video diaries, and I was listening to these very calming, long forty five minute videos that took its time, stuff that I wasn't compelled, like Philip DeFranco, you know, somebody you, you, he wants you to look at the screen, look at the screen. I wanted, I don't even care if people look at the screen. I thought. I'm going to create that. 
I'm going to create what inspires me to paint. So that was my conversation with Adam. I hope you enjoyed it. I had a really fun time. If you want to see more videos just like this one, consider watching this one right here. Subscribe if you want to see even more on a regular basis. And I will see you in the next one. I'm hoping to do more interviews like this with like other professional artists. There's so much information out there that is so valuable. And if I can share that with you guys, that would be amazing. So I hope you learned something and I will see you in the next one. Bye, guys.